financial literacy discussion topic for today is buying back the block. Today we have an expert on the call by the name Chris Senegal. Christopher Senegal holds a degree in civil engineering. His residential real estate experience began in 2008 as he flipped single family homes and owns multiple uh, real estate properties. In 2013, Chris started Invictus Development Group to focus on revitalizing disenfranchised communities. Uh, he has been featured in several major news outlets for his efforts to bring moderately priced single family developments back to communities that once thrived, but now has a low income housing focus. His goal is to bring higher incomes back to these communities from the suburbs so that the, the neighborhoods become more attractive for businesses. Thank you again, Chris. Please begin. Thank you. Thank you for the, the warm introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone today. So yeah, my name is Christopher Senegal. Uh, he's in Lake Charles, Louisiana, Fort Worth, Texas. I uh, moved to Houston in 2008. And um, my background in college was uh, I went to school for civil engineering, got a corporate job. Uh, corporate world was hated, and uh, they sold a dream. So I just tried to figure out how to get out. Um, so I started reading books, started figuring out uh, different ways of, of creating your own destiny, basically, with taking control of your money, figuring out how to make money work for me instead of working for money. Um, okay, hey, so, hey, Chris, Chris, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, your audio is um is going in and out. Do you want to try to maybe uh, reconnect? Because it's like staticky. Oh, it's staticky. Hold on, wait, let me try to change the mic. Let me see. Is that better? Yes, yeah, better. We just we just lost you a second. We just lost you again. All right, let's see. How about now? I can hear you. Let's say say a couple of sentences. <laughs> okay, let's see. Is it is it breaking up? Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, perfect. All right. So yeah, so um, like I said, I went to college for civil engineering. Got out, got the corporate job. Didn't like it. Uh, started reading books. Kept hearing about real estate over and over, and realized that real estate was a way that most people generate first generation wealth. So. Uh, that's the route I started going. So I kept the corporate job, but I spent all my free time uh, learning how to renovate houses, flip houses, um, sell some. I kept some for rentals, just created cash flow. And by 2015, I was actually able to walk away from my job because I had replaced my income uh, through real estate. Um, and it's a great feeling to be able to walk off of a job instead of you know getting fired from a job. Um, they were actually about to give me a promotion, and I turned down the promotion and, and chose to leave. Um, so in the process of doing all that, doing fix and flip, which is, you know, it's a very selfish model where there's nothing wrong with that, but you're building independent, uh, financial freedom, you know, solely for yourself. Um, and what I noticed in that process is a lot of times the neighborhoods that I would be renovating houses in, um, and then relisting and selling would be neighborhoods that were our neighborhoods. Uh, but the buyers wouldn't look like me once I got finished with the, with the project. Um, or if I rented, if I bought a, a house to rent, I would rent it and fix it up really nicely. And then the renter wouldn't look like me. And so for me, it, um, my focus became, you know, how, how, how can I change that? How can I do something bigger and better? And so gentrification just became like my focus. And, um, in 2013, I was able to get in contact with the seller who owned an entire block of property. And for me, that I was like the aha moment. It's like, okay, so if I can control a bigger parcel of real estate in one neighborhood, if I can control this entire block, and uh, I can better control what happens to the block, and I can be more aware of what I'm doing. And so I bought the block in 2013, and um, I didn't know what I was going to do with it at that point in time, but I knew eventually uh, it was going to be a project worth pursuing. It was just north of downtown Houston at Fifth Ward. And in the city of Houston, uh, redevelopment was kind of going counterclockwise around downtown. It started in the Heights and then went to Midtown. Then, uh, you know, it started in Third Ward and then the east side of downtown. And then Fifth Ward was like the last quadrant. And so I knew eventually uh, things were gonna happen there. Um, so from there, uh, I, what I did for a few years was just kept the property, kept the raggedy houses that were on it, didn't really fix them up. But I did parolee housing. 
So all that felons that got out of prison that couldn't find anywhere else to live rent rooms for me. And so they would rent individual rooms for 350, all bills paid. But if it's four, four sleeping areas in the house, like three bedrooms in the living room, I was making $1,400 off of a house that I couldn't rent for anything more than like $800 max. So I was able to get good cash flow off of it, um, make sure that it was paying for itself without me investing a whole lot into it. And that gave me time to figure out the plan. And so from in 2016, redevelopment did start in the neighborhood. And so at that point, I realized, okay, now it's time to try to get this game plan together for what I'm gonna do. And so I started networking with people, um, networking with builders, uh, architects, developers, and trying to find somebody that was willing to give me the game. And it took about a year. Most people don't want to give you the game. You know, sometimes they'll, they'll give you enough to uh, have you dangerous. You know, you know, just enough to get started, but not enough to complete it. And so I was, I was in that cycle for about a year. Um, and finally, I found the builder that was willing to help me. Um, and I had to pay him a uh, consulting fee of $10,000 for him to show me how to do new construction. So um, he basically gave me the whole blueprint. He gave me uh, all of his contacts. It was my responsibility to get everything done that I did. And then once um, I was to the point where I had construction about to start, um, I just started using my social media platform to educate everyone on the importance of buying in, in our neighborhoods and the neighborhoods that are revitalizing, especially because that's gentrification at, at, at its core. If things revitalize and we don't participate in it because we're worried about you know, what happens to the poor people that are there, then we leave it up to complete strangers to come in and take over our neighborhoods, you know, take over our communities. Um, and when they take over, you know, they do what they want to do. And then, you know, then it's even worse for the people that we thought we were, we were thinking about. Because the people that you leave them to be surrounded by that are taking over the neighborhood care nothing about them at all. So they're going to displace them. So for me, it, it, was, it was like, okay, I'm going to consciously build. I know that the block of property that I had, there was no residence there. I didn't knock on anybody's door and ask anybody to leave. So I'm not displacing anyone. So this was a perfect block to build nice construction on to bring people back to the neighborhood because you need higher incomes in our communities in order for the businesses to want to come back. Uh, no matter how much you beg a grocery store or you, you, beg a, you beg a retail store or restaurant to come to a neighborhood, they're not going to come if they don't see the incomes in the community um, uh, high enough to where they know that they're going to make money once they open. Okay, and it's very important. So, so for me, that was the first project and that project has been a success. I'm building 14 houses. Um, selling them between two seventy nine and three hundred and nine thousand each. Uh, they are selling. These are the same, same prices that uh, young black professionals uh, work that uh, they live in the suburbs pay. So it's the same price that actually you're gonna be able to buy a house in the city, uh, in the heart of a neighborhood that's revitalizing, where there's a huge mixed use development project coming. It's like one hundred and fifty acres. It's a project by the same developers that built uh, City Center, which is a, a probably the num number one development in Houston as far as mixed use for like restaurants, hotels, business centers, and all that kind of stuff. Same thing is coming to Fifth Ward. So everybody that's buying these houses from me will have a lot of value appreciation over the next few years. Um, and then the next, the next part of that project for me was how do you protect the existing residents? So another big group that always gets displaced are the renters because people come in and buy the rental properties. And then once they own them, they, they immediately renovate them and they immediately raise the rents. What that does also is that displaces the, the, the long-term renters that have been in the neighborhood that have not had the opportunity to increase their income in life and their own fixed incomes. So what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm taking a whole portfolio, kind of the same situation, one owner that owns an entire portfolio of uh, rental properties, it's like 18 houses and two commercial buildings. I've negotiated with them to uh, sell or finance the project to me. Um, so I didn't mention this, both of my big projects, I did not go to a bank. I negotiated with the sellers because the sellers have owned it so long that they don't have a mortgage on it anymore. So I can just offer them a down payment that I pay directly to them and I offer a payment on terms that I pay directly to them, monthly payments every month until it reaches uh, whatever the agreed upon purchase price is. So for, for, so for the portfolio of rental properties, 18 houses have long-term tenants. Some of the tenants have been there 30 years. Some of them have been there. Uh, there's two sisters that have been there 20 years living next door to each other. And one of them's daughter lives on the property. So it's like a small community of long-term stable tenants, whereas if you go in and try to raise the rents, um, you know, they can't afford it. They're all going to be displaced, and this is going to be hard for 18 other people to be relocated in that same little neighborhood. So you're basically you're effectively moving them out of the neighborhood. So what, my goal was to buy it and keep their rents exactly the same. 
Um, and that's what I did. I bought it in March. I was able to buy it and keep the rents exactly the same. It's 18 houses, but um, between 18 houses, it's bringing in like $11,000 a month, right? And I, I bought it for the whole project I bought, whole portfolio was for $1.25 million. That's, so that's 20 different uh, rental properties, two of them being commercial for $1.25 million. Um, and it's already bringing in 11000 a month without the commercial space bringing in any revenue. So my goal was to buy it, keep the cash flow, and then uh, renovate the commercial spaces so that the commercial spaces can produce a lot more revenue for the property. Between the two commercial spaces, I can make another $9,000 a month. So I can take that property from uh, $11,000 to $20,000 a month in revenue without having to displace anybody. And I'm bringing businesses back. I'm creating uh, the, the businesses that are in there will create jobs. Um, it's, it's bringing the street that the, the property is on back to life. The, the street called Lions Avenue. That was the historically uh, black business district uh, for Fifth Ward. So when everything was segregated, the street was full of doctors, lawyers, attorneys. Uh, I'll say lawyers twice. Um, pharmacies, uh, retail, restaurants, anything you could think of was on the street because the, you know. The black community had to have their own everything because we can we, we weren't, weren't allowed to patronize the white uh, locations. So um, yeah, so what I tried what, once I put all that together, I realized, man, this is the perfect project to allow other people to invest with because it's not risky. It's already got revenue coming in, um, and it's something where I know that it's stable. And if I let other investors invest with me, then everybody can win, and it can be a blueprint for what we can do collectively in our community. So that's what I did. Started a crowd fund for that. The crowdfund actually raised a million dollars, um, so that that uh, gave us gave me enough money to do all the renovations on all the buildings, which we're currently doing now. Um, and then I'm actually going to buy some adjacent properties. But now the the scope of the project is even bigger. We're on another commercial building with another big lot. Um, and yeah, so uh, that's going to increase the rent the rental revenue to about twenty five thousand a month. So yeah, so the the project. Um, is doing extremely well. Um, if anybody's following me on social media or if you want to follow me after this, you can see updates on the project. I'm always posting about it. Um, it's also on buytheblock.com, which is the website that I used uh, to set up the, uh, the crowdfund for that portion of the project. Um, so yeah, I know we said we're going to keep it about 20 minutes. So I guess one more thing I'll touch on really quickly is there's three parts to gentrification. There is, of course, bringing the higher incomes back. Of course, the second part is the the uh, the renters that are already there, making sure you protect them. And the third part is the homeowners. So what happens usually when areas revitalize is the property taxes go up and a lot of long-term residents on fixed incomes um, cannot afford to pay their property taxes, even if they pay their, ca their houses off uh, in cash, you know. So my focus now is getting with the local government, city government and the county government to implement what's already been implemented in other cities. Uh, Baltimore has it, Philadelphia has it, and it's basically a program where if you own your home for a certain period of time, usually over five years or before the revitalization started, or you're a senior, then you are exempt from the property tax increases. And you know that's that should be something that that we really should implement in this market, so that we can ensure that the long-term people that have really worked hard to build these homes, own these homes, and some of them didn't even use bank loans. You know, um, they've inherited these properties from like before 1950. A lot of how the black people built their homes from scratch uh, without using the bank, you know, uh, just using building out of their savings. And so for them to lose it now, or maybe the next generation to lose it now for property taxes is really a uh, traffic. It's really a bad situation. So that's the, that's the three parts to gentrification. That's why people, I guess, kind of come coming to buy the block, uh, actually doing it before it became a catchphrase, you know? Uh, and so, yeah, that's what we're here now. So I'll, I'll open it up for questions. I know you guys probably have a lot of questions. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, for that uh, for that powerful uh, message around your story and some of the things that you've been working on. Uh, for the people on the uh, on the call, please, if you have a question for the speaker, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself uh, to ask a question. But I'm just going to start with my first question, Chris. Uh, I follow you on Instagram, and there was one post that kind of caught our attention. Uh, you mentioned that owning real estate is not generational wealth. Can you just talk, touch on that a little bit more? Yeah. So people. I uh, think automatically that if you own real estate and you have a bunch of real estate properties and they're all cash flowing, that you're creating generational wealth. Well, if you guys listen to my story, the, the two, the two groups that I, the two big pieces of property that I just bought, I bought from people that had a whole bunch of real estate. 
And in both situations, their kid did not want to take over the real estate. The kids see the headache that it takes if you don't have the right systems in the place, in place how hard it is for property management purposes to maintain tenants, to maintain rental repairs, or maintain all this stuff. Uh, a house's useful life is only 40 years before you really need to go in and renovate it completely. So if you don't have all of those things in place, what you've created is financial freedom for you for the next 30 or 40 years. What's more important is that you educate your children on uh, what to do with this money, how to, how to retain this asset, how to maintain this asset, um, how to improve this asset, and how to grow that portfolio. So that applies to real estate. That also applies to a business. If you have a business and you think it's because you started it, if you don't teach your kids how to run it, or if you don't put the proper management in place to run it, if your kids don't have any interest in it, that's not generational wealth. That's, that's something that's helped you get ahead. And hopefully, you know, it's helped you position your kids to help them do other things. But generational wealth is completely different. Generational wealth is where you have wealth, number one, the definition is um, passive income exceeding your lifestyle. Okay? So if you are not there, if you just have, like I said, if you just own real estate and, you know, you have not a uh, lifestyle in a position where it's less, where the cost of living is less than your net profit and it's comfortably below and it's continuing to do that year over year over year, then that's not really wealth. That's just financial freedom. Um, Uh, thank you so much for, for that um, answer. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Babalola. Um, he has a question. Mr. Babalola, please feel free to unmute yourself. And ask hey, Chris, man, I, I love your story. Um, can you touch on your, can you touch on, I'll listen to your EYL interview. I'm listening here and it's, it's great to hear it again. But look, what about your team? Like describe the team surrounding you to get all this done. Like I don't, I'm just now getting into real estate. I'm just, I'm like a entrepreneur at this point. I'm trying to get in. Um, but explain your team. Like, how, how are you able to create systems and to, to generate these transactions, these, these large-scale fundraise um, crowdfunding processes? Can you just touch on that? Yeah, so to, to be successful in anything, I call it the success triangle. You, you need three things, right? You need the knowledge and the experience. experience that's one. You need the opportunity, that's two. And you need the money, that's three, okay? So uh, in certain situations, you, you always have to evaluate which one do you have, what do you bring to the table? Um, so for me, for the most part, in the real estate, I had the opportunity on the, on the block side, right? Because I was able to control the entire block of property. Then I had to go out and find the other two, the money um, and the knowledge and the experience. So as I told you earlier, the the money part was easy in this scenario because I was able to negotiate with the seller to go out and, uh, or to allow me to owner finance it from them. So I did not have to go to a bank. So the seller ended up bringing me the opportunity and being part of the money solution. I just had to bring the down payment, um, which I had from selling other properties. Then it, then it, then it comes to the knowledge and experience and that's everything you're asking about now. So I had no experience with redevelopment, uh, no, no experience with any of that except fix, flipping houses. So with flipping houses, it's it's a pretty cookie cutter process. Um, you need a realtor on your team that um, that understands the market value of rehabbed houses in that neighborhood. So you don't want to get a realtor that only focuses on helping people buy homes to live in. You want a realtor that works with investors or a realtor that works with uh, builders because they understand what the investor's mindset is, what the investor's looking for. And there's a whole lot of things that a retail agent just doesn't know. A retail agent means someone just works with people who homes to live in just doesn't know. Okay, so then, so then you need a good contractor on your team. The contractor is the one that's gonna tell you how much it's gonna cost to rehab the house or to build the new construction that you're trying to do. Okay, and then you're gonna need an architect that's gonna give you the plans and designs for that build and for that new construction. So those three people are really key to your team because they are the ones that are going to allow you to know if you do this and you do this, um, if, and it's going to cost this much, um, plus what it's going to, you know, the, the acquisition cost of the, the, the as is property, then, then you, the realtor will tell you that value that'll be worth when it's done. And then if that value that is going to be worth when it's done is uh, more than those other three numbers, then it, it, it has the potential to be profitable, right? You also want to know how long it's going to take that property to sell because you will have financial carrying costs to that property sales. So um, those are the, 
the core members of your team, the architect, the contractor, um, and the realtor. So that, that's whether you're doing fix and flip or you're doing new construction. Um, with new construction, the architect is also gonna help you do the site planning, uh, help you get uh, everything submitted to the city for permits for, 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 for building. And sometimes you may need them if you're doing a really extensive rehab on the house. Those are the key three, three key people for any part of real estate. Then when you get uh, bigger uh, into bigger projects, um, financial relationships will be important as well. Um, so if you can use banks, you can use lenders that are called hard money lenders if you want to. These guys are mainly investors themselves and they charge, uh, whereas, whereas if you go to Chase, you may get a 3.5% loan. These guys are gonna charge 11 to 15% interest. Uh, it's a short-term loan, usually for a year or less. Uh, and they look at those same numbers that I just explained to you. And if those numbers make sense for them, they'll loan you up to 70% of the total project cost. Um, well, I mean, sorry, of the total project value when it's complete. And they call that the ARV, the after repair value, or as complete value if it's new construction. So they give you up to 70% of that. So if you can figure out a way to make all of your expenses below that 70% uh, threshold, good chance that you have you can pay a, uh, hardly anything at closing. Um, they'll just use the property as collateral because as investors themselves, they know that if anything goes wrong with the project, they'll take the project from you um, and they can sell it themselves or they can't finish it themselves, right? right. So, um, so, so you got the uh, realtor, contractor, architect, um, and then the, the, the financial resources. If you wanna go private money, find some doctors, some lawyers, um, anybody, uh, any, uh, entrepreneurs, anybody that has, uh, may have a large amount of money in the bank and then you but don't go to them until you have identified the rest of your team because they're going to know you're new, right? And you're going to go ask them for a hundred thousand dollars and they'll be like, no, you're crazy. But if you say, Hey, check this out. I got this contractor that just did three houses this year. I got this realtor that works with five other investors. I got this architect that designs for all these people. I got this whole team together and they're telling me I can build this for this. It's going to be worth when it's done. All I need is some money. So you, are you in, are you out? Then that's a whole different conversation. Then they're like, wow, you really built a team. Because any other time they're just gonna be looking at you like, well, I'm not about to gamble with my money, you know? So um, th that that's the, the basic of the network that you need. Um, anything else that you're gonna need, somebody uh, of those four people will have the connections. So don't try to figure it out yourself. Like I said, the three parts of that success triangle, you don't wanna, you don't wanna wait till you have all three. If you try to wait till you have all three, you'll never get there. Your goal is to go out and find the other two. Um, maybe, maybe you do have the uh, knowledge and experience. Maybe you come from a construction background, but you don't have the opportunity. Well, that's when you network with, with uh, realtors or, or other investors or wholesalers who find deals. And then, you know, then you go get the opportunity and you find the money. Or you got, maybe you have the money. And you maybe, so then you should go network locally with uh, at the real estate investment group and find some investors to partner with and maybe loan them the money for the first deal or two so that you can learn that way. So uh, just figure out which one of those three you have and figure out how to find the other two. Thank you. Appreciate that. No problem. Hello? Yes. Hi, I have a quick question for you. Um, so I ultimately am a real estate uh, investor as well. And you talked about um, you talked about putting money into buying uh, buying a whole block. How were you able to source that block? Like how how did you find that? Um, were you looking for it? Did someone bring that to you? And then also you talked about crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. Are you giving any percentage to those people who crowdfunded that project, or are you? Was it is it more of a thank you for crowdfunding this this development? <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's so the first question. Um, so I, I, when you're in the business of real estate investing and development, you should be letting everybody know what you do because you never know where a lead is going to come from, from someone having a family member that, that, uh, is moving, that needs to sell a house, somebody that maybe, maybe was an investor and, you know, they're, they're tired of, uh, investing and they're trying to, maybe they want to dispose of their portfolio to go and start another business or something. Um, could be somebody about to lose their property to taxes. Um, or it could be specifically you're talking to, like I said, wholesalers earlier. Wholesalers are groups that actually uh, specifically focus on finding distressed sellers. And the, all they do is get those properties under contract and then they hand them to their investors for a profit. Um, so the second deal that I got, the one that I did crowdfund came from a wholesaler. 
Um, he had reached out to me. He's like, hey, I was just calling this. I was calling people that on the tax roll that would look like their their ownership address was different from their residential address where they actually live, which means that house had to be an investment property or like a, a family property that they just owned. So that I was calling them to see if they wanted to sell. And they actually told me they had a whole portfolio they were getting ready to get rid of. They were trying to list it and sell it all. So he brought that lead to me and that's how I got it. Um, but like I said, they come from all different ways. The, the first one that I'm doing new construction on just came from word of mouth. Uh, someone who knew that I was an investor was like, hey, Chris, this might be an opportunity for you. I know because he knew one of the tenants that was on the property at that time. And they were complaining about the owner being a, a slumlord and on drugs and, you know, just wasn't taking care of the property. So, uh, yeah, the leads come from everywhere. Sometimes you can find it on MLS. You can find, you know, acre land on MLS or something. Um, so there's all different resources for that. And so to answer the crowdfund question, the crowdfund is definitely not a charitable gift. It's not like GoFundMe. Uh, what this is, is so before uh, the Jobs Act, which was passed when Barack Obama was in office, regular people could not collectively invest in million dollar real estate projects. You had to be what was called accredited, which means uh, you had to be worth over a million dollars or you have to have made $250,000 or more for the past two years consecutive. Okay. So, uh, and what, the way they call that collective investment is they use a fancy word called syndication. It's the same thing. Um, well, when the job act, Jobs Act was passed, uh, it basically opened it up to where everyone can collectively invest in um, real estate projects, but the, the, uh, the, the top end cap on the, the amount that can be raised is $1,070,000, and the individual investment can be no more than $10,000 if they're not accredited. So with that model, um, you can raise up to a million dollars, and it's, it's your determination on what you give in return. So what I did was I took 40% of the company that actually owns all the real estate and I broke it up into $50 shares and I sold those shares. Okay, so in exchange for that, every person that has a share, they, they'll, they'll get to participate in 40% of the net profit of the project. Okay, so um, every, every, well, twice a year, I, I take up all the revenue, subtract all the expenses and what's left, 40% of that is divided up amongst all the shareholders and they all get a cut. Also, as the property value goes up, the value of the shares go up because they actually own a piece of the real estate. So that's how I structured that deal. Okay, that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, quick question, uh, from Chris, this is Wale. Uh, you mentioned uh, about fixing and flips, right? And making sure you have the correct realtor that knows about, you know, fixing and flips. I mean, I know there's companies like Remask and, you know, different real estate companies. How can you find like a, a real estate agent that knows about fixing and flips? I, the easiest way is to go and uh, I think the most common location you're going to find the, the, the uh, a concentration of real estate investment professionals is going to be on a social media platform. Usually Facebook, if whatever city you're in, or the nearest big city to you, just type in uh, real estate investor meetup, you know, real estate investors in whatever city, you put that city's name in, I guarantee you it's gonna bring you a whole bunch of groups. And when you look at those groups, um, you're gonna go in there and it's gonna be investors talking, it'll be agents talking, it'll be wholesalers talking, and you just wanna find out when the next meetup is and go over there and network. That's really the best way if you don't have a network of your own. I mean, another easy way is you really use an Instagram hashtag, like real estate investing, put your city name in, it's going to pull people up that are doing it. Um, especially like in Houston, there's actually a, a Black Real Estate Investor Association, Houston Black Real Estate Investor Association is the actual name of it. And, and uh, they meet up once a month. So um, not necessarily saying that everybody on the team has to be Black, it's cool if you can do that. But, um, you know, if, if the other person has your best interest in mind and, you know, they just want to make money with you, you know, go for it. Hey, can you can you drop the name of that group on the chat, please, um, Chris? Oh yeah, yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Um, so, anybody else on the call, please, if you have a question for Chris, please feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask a question, please. Hey, Chris. Uh, <laughs> Everybody, all at once. <laughs> I know. Hey, Chris. Uh, really inspired by the story, right? Quick one for you. You mentioned you left a copy job. What gave you that confidence to make that big jump, right? To leave the comfortable corporate job to go to, I guess, the fear of the unknown, right? Can you just 
discuss a little bit about what you got confidence to make that jump? Uh, uh, yeah, I would say frustration out of, out of anything else. Um, I, I, I mean, I had worked hard to be able to get to that point. So um, I had um, started real estate investing in 2008. This was 2015 when I quit. So seven and a half years, I was still at the job. And um, it got to a point to where there were some things going on where, like, I noticed all my coworkers, everybody else was white. I was the last one to get a promotion. So when they finally offered me the promotion, I was like, well, you know, it's kind of like up in the face. And they wanted me to move to Dallas. I didn't want to move to Dallas. And I was making enough money from real estate to where um, I really, I didn't have to work anymore, you know. So it's a different level when you don't have any steady income coming in or you don't know how to generate money for yourself. But once you figure that out, um, then it, it's a lot less stressful because you know you don't have that financial stress on you. And then what I also decided to do too, something else that everybody on this call should do, uh, is whatever you do as a profession, if you do decide to go full-time entrepreneur um, or full-time investor, don't just throw that experience away, become a consultant. And so that's what I did. I took um, everything that I was doing for my corporate job. I started a new LinkedIn profile. I started my own company, put my own name on it, called myself president. And then I started consulting and doing the exact same work I was doing when I worked in the corporate job. So for me, what I was doing, I was doing, um, uh, I worked for the railroad, so I was selling shipping rates. So this was like oil and gas industrial products company. So like Exxon, Chevron, those types of companies, when they wanted to get product from a refinery to an end destination, um, they had to go through the railroad, they had to ship on the railroad. So, and, uh, and they all own these fleets of tank cars. So I had all, I knew, uh, a lot of the contacts for the decision makers at these companies in their logistics and supply chain departments. So I took those contacts and then I went out to market to the people that were trying to get service contracts with these same companies. So if they repaired real cars, if they clean real cars, if they stored real cars, um, they wanted to get business from the railroads. Uh, I mean, not from the railroads, from these customers. So I just became a middleman. I, I, I would go to them and be like, well, you know, if you want to get this business, tell me what you're looking for. Um, and I went to the contacts that I had and I would bring business for them. And that was like passive income. Um, because once I introduced the two and there was a contract in place, that customer or my client did all the work, you know. And so I still do that to this day. Um, so I do that and the real estate. So it's just, it, you can have multiple streams of income that also makes you feel more secure. If one thing is moving slow at some point in time, um, say when the economy is down and nobody's really chipping by rail, I'm still doing real estate. Sometimes they're both booming. Sometimes, uh, the real movie woman, if the real estate is like, I'm in a holding pattern waiting for things to be finished with the, uh, you know, with the development plan or something like that, or getting something out of permitting, you know? Uh, so yeah, so it's just, this is about making sure that you have a solid plan in place before you jump. Now, some people like to jump finally, you know, it's like jumping off a cliff, they say, and they said it's a sink or swim at that point. Um, I chose not to go that route. It's kind of risky. Um, you know, it really just all depends on your risk tolerance. Thank you. Hey, um, Chris, this is, um, this is Dapper here. Um, great insight. Um, I guess one of the things I want to ask you is this. Um, for most Africans, uh, most Black people, like, uh, we, we don't have so much saved up to want to go into uh, real estate and things like that. But what most people don't also know is that uh, you can use whatever you have to actually start up. You can always be like an investor because um, people that flip in and all that stuff, they always need money here and there. Mm -hmm. You can start with that, get comfortable, and then start actually, the people you're lending to, you can start talking to them and see how you can get involved deeply. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if you can expand on that. And also, um, if somebody like me, I mean, I've been working with people that invest in real estate. Uh, if I want to connect with you or invest, uh, I mean, on the block or something like that, how can I get in touch with you if you're still um, interested? In that? Yeah. Okay. So actually, so the buy the block project, that particular project, it reached the max. It reached the it reached the million seventy. So that project is actually fully funded. Um, but there are other opportunities to invest, like you said. Um, what I do is I also have. Uh, a small group of students that are doing new construction and doing fix and flip. And what we do collectively is if I can find the sources of money for them, like you say, like 
people that just have money sitting in an account um, that they aren't really using um, or they want to get a better return on it than leaving it in a savings account, then we take their money and we use it to fund the projects and then we pay them 15% interest on the money, uh, which is a very good return uh, versus say the risk is so low because you're, you're investing with uh, experienced developers, experienced flippers and rehabbers and builders. Um, so yeah, uh, I do that a lot. And it is a good way for you to learn because at, since your money's in the project, you have full exposure to the project. You get to see what's going on from start to finish. You get to ask questions, you get to pop up on the job site. You know, you get to, you get to see the whole process and you learn that way versus trying to figure it out on your own. So it's like, it's like a learn and earn uh, program. It cuts your risk down and you're making a return. Instead of you going to pay somebody $10,000 to teach you how to flip, you lend to somebody that is flipping and you get returns in the process. Um, so yeah, anybody that wants to uh, participate in that with me, you can just send me an email at, uh, oh, I'll put that in the chat too, but it's just chris at learnfromchris.com. Uh, chris at learnfromchris.com. And then I'll, as we have projects that come up, I'll let you know, you know how much we're looking to raise. Uh, and of course, with the interest rate is gonna be 15% and then the, the expected turnaround times, so how long we'll, we'll have your money before you get it back. It, that is project specific. Production takes a lot longer than a flip. So, um, yeah, it all varies, but yeah. Hello, Chris, uh -oh. how are you? Good. Good. Now, you're doing big things, that's lovely. Are you, will you expand outside America to the continent? I have I have been approached about that a lot, and I eventually will. Uh, it'll probably be three to five years before I do that. Um, maybe no, no sooner than two years for sure, because I, I have to get these projects completed here. Okay. Um, yeah, but I, I know there are a lot of opportunities uh, yes. back there, and um, I've been approached by a couple of guys that they work with developers, in, especially specifically in Nigeria. Um, and they were wanting me to come in and do some work with them, um, but I'm definitely, I'm definitely, definitely very open to it. Oh, you should. It's, it's, it's going to be big. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. Yeah, well, yeah, because I'm in a couple of projects, one in Nigeria, one in Ghana. So okay. I got the information. So yeah, yeah, definitely send me the information. I would love to talk about it more. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gloria. Um, um, I think we have uh, a question from Mr. Babalula. Um, please go ahead. Hello, hello, sorry. Um, I have a question. Um, what market? So, all right, so th this is the thing that discourages me a lot. I live in the DC metro area, yeah, and it's so expensive out here just to get like a condo. I mean, you're 350 con for condos, it's a lot, it's very expensive. So, I guess my question is kind of twofold. Like, the first thing is where you're I know you're trying to work on a protocol or trying to make this type of process with buying the block uh, re repeatable right so are there other markets that you're looking at outside of Houston or is it you know or is this something that you just kind of focus on your area that you're from, of expertise at this point and if you have looked in other markets where uh, yeah, so right now, it's an, I mean, this this whole initiative is really just getting traction. So I've really been working hard on it for the past like 18 months. So now that I've kind of created the blueprint for for, uh, for both models, um, I, I can expand out into other markets. I will continue to work in this specific neighborhood in Houston because there's so much opportunity here. Um, and it's, it's a, a lot of... Uh, a lot of value appreciation is going to happen in this particular market, so I will always have projects actively going on in this neighborhood. But I, I do, I am looking at other areas right now too. Uh, one of the things I look for are cities that have a, a neighborhood that at once was thriving and, and there's a demand for it to come back. And there's also some type of sign of economic stimulus going on, meaning some type of redevelopment has already started in the neighborhood uh, that usually won't include us. But it, it's a focus of mine like, to to get as close to that activity as possible and then start controlling everything around it. So for one, uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, I have property out there, we can do a project there, which is what, what you call a secondary market. It's not one of the major cities, um, but it's a, it's a decent sized city. 
uh, I'm looking at a, a project with a group in Chicago in an area that was called that's called Brownsville, which used to be the Black Wall Street of Chicago. Um, so yeah, uh, so those are two projects that I'm active, actively pursuing that I'll probably have something rolling by the end of the year. But definitely always open to new markets. And the goal is to start in these these affordable or these these uh, markets where you can control large uh, components of real estate relatively inexpensively, and then move to the more higher price markets later once you once you uh, establish a lot of capital. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, and you, all right. And you had a, you you have a mentorship type program, like a coaching type of program, or is it just a um, learn and earn program that you described? I do have a mentorship program. Um, it's fifteen hundred to get into that program, and I just set you up basically with all my resources. It really works best for the people that are local here to Houston. Um, right. I, mean, I, I don't provide as, I I can't uh, provide as much value to somebody in a different market because I don't have the connections there. You know, but as far as like, I mean, you still learn a lot in the, in the process. Um, but what it is, is it's a collective group. Some of them are wholesalers. Some of them are starting new construction. Some of them are doing fix and flip. But we all meet up and I go, I walk everybody through the different processes and the different stages of whatever project they have going so that everybody kind of learns from each other. And on top of that, like I said, you have access to my realtors, my, my contractors, uh, my title companies, uh, basically everybody that you need to be successful in real estate. Uh, yeah, we, but we, we like but what if what if you're not what if you don't live in Houston but you want to start investing in that area? Would that would it it would be helpful, right? Yeah, That's yeah, you definitely okay. yeah, you definitely do that as well. Yeah, and yeah, so you'd be learning what you know remotely uh, about what's going on here in the local market, and yeah, you definitely. I mean, yeah, being, being physically present is definitely not a requirement to invest in Houston. Um, like I said, because the, I have the whole team, so it, it's definitely uh, possible as well. Okay, All right. thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Um, um, Chris, we have a few more questions for you. We have Deanna. Deanna um, uh, wants to ask you a question. Go ahead, Deanna, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, thank you. Hi, Chris, this is Deanna. Uh, thank you for this information. I think I saw one of your posts just how I think the word gentrification has such a bad taste to it because of what we've seen happen in neighborhoods. But I really like the conversation that you're talking about. We can we can do that and who can do it better for ourselves than us. So thank you for that. My question is, I think it's always important to understand, like, what's your why behind what you do? What's, you know, what, what are you, what's your vision and mission for what you're doing and how you're doing it? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think the most important thing for me is, and this, this applies here and it applies back, back in Africa as well. I think for some reason we, we let colonization brainwash us and when we forget that, Everything that we say is so hard to do, we did it before. You know, we had all this before. Even in the United States, before, like I said, before desegregation, we had our own communities. We didn't need affirmative action to get jobs because we were the employers. We had the jobs. We, you know, we had former slaves that started more banks and started more businesses. That these people were actually slaves than we have now, right? And but but we we, we blame everything on a slave mentality or or this or that here in the United States. And then, uh, you know, there's a lot of fight, uh, even back in Africa with the Europeans that figured out how to conquer, that, you know, that, that continent through, through, um, through a mentality. And so for me, it's like, man, it's so much bigger than just making money personally. It's about, you know, we, we really can do this. And we, we really did do this already. It's not like we got to figure it out. We just got to stop thinking everything is brand new and realize that the blueprint is all around us, especially when you look at other minority groups like the Asians and the Indians who have these systems set up. And that you know they thrive, you know. Um, so I mean, it's for me, it's just about us collectively getting back to that point. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Miss anybody else on the line who wants to ask the speaker a question? Please feel free to unmute yourself. Hey, Chris, uh, I'm going to ask one more question, right? So you mentioned paying about ten thousand to get someone to show you the game. Can you explain just that process and how you had that much coverage to? get the money to go through that process? So what I've learned in, uh, on the entrepreneurship side of things is whatever you're trying to do that you haven't done before, it's going to cost you, right? It's either, it's either going to cost you uh, stress, headache, bumping your head, failure, and money to try to figure it out on your own, or you just pay somebody that's already doing it to show you the blueprint that's already made all those mistakes before, right? So when, I, when you think about 
the ten thousand dollars that I paid him, I had actually lost about thirty five thousand dollars before that trying to do the development on my own, picking the wrong team, paying the wrong architects, uh, paying for things I shouldn't have paid for it out of order, um, and having to redo it because the the permit required me to do this in this order, and they wanted to choose who the service provider was, you know. So those types of things, like you either pay that real world tuition and bump your head, or you just pay for somebody to teach you, uh, you know, the game that's that you clearly see has a track record of success not someone that speaks eloquently or speaks articulately about the subject has no no actual proof of what they can do you only want to deal with people that are actually doing it where you know you, you know the only reason that they're even going to take the time out to teach you because you're paying them because their, their time is more valuable than teaching somebody for free you know um so i mean that, that that's really it in a nutshell there's no cookie cutter answer for it outside of the fact that you gotta you, you're gonna have to pay for the knowledge somewhere and I always I always tell people the, the shortest road to success is just copying the right cat paying that person to let them copy to, to let you copy awesome thank you so much yeah no problem yes chris thank you so much for that answer we have a question um on the chat uh, this is from yacha uh she said um or he said uh is there a financial minimum for investors Oh, uh, for, so for the project, yes. For um, anything I'm doing outside of a, uh, outside of a crowdfunded, the minimum is going to be five thousand to invest. Um, now the crowdfunded was only two hundred and fifty dollars. It was really low, uh, which I like about it because it gave everybody the opportunity to invest anything. You know, um, that's money you blow on the weekend, going out or something, or on a pair of shoes. So yeah, but for the bigger projects uh, or the, the fix and flip type project, yeah, the minimum is five thousand. That way, I don't have too too many people involved in it. You know, um, does that they can get kind of hairy, but yeah, that's not. Hi. Um, so if we are interested in real estate and we wanted to, um, like learn or just get started, what do we need to do? I know you mentioned you had some mentorship program, it's a thousand five hundred. Um, I also heard you say we can send you an email. I'm just kind of confused. Where, like, how can we access you if we're interested in this? Yeah. So, okay, good question. So, I have other levels too. So, for the person that's like, like green and just wanting to get started from scratch, on the same website, learnfromchris.com, I have a program that's you just sign up. It's like thirty-seven thousand a month to be a member, and it's just like a a living library of resources for you to read at your own pace. Uh, like links to YouTube videos, links to resources. Um, and it'll get you the basics to understand like where you want to go in real estate. Um, some people may not want to even be investors or may not want to risk capital. You may want to just become a real estate agent. You can make money doing that too. Um, so it's, it's several different components that you can get into. So that's one resource uh, that's a little bit in depth and kind of concentrated. Um, my Instagram platform, I, I educate a lot on there. There's always links to uh, myself, and I'm also sharing other people in, in the business uh, that are doing it, so you can follow all of them. Um, YouTube, there's lots of uh, content on YouTube, on my YouTube, um, and a couple other people that you'll see me reposting. They have good content there. So you, there's a ton, tons of resources um, for you to be able to you know, get your feet wet and just kind of get a basic understanding and decide if you want to invest more heavily into it or Hey, Chris, it looks like we, we lost the, the last uh, couple of words you said. Oh, the last couple of words? Yeah. Um, well, I was just saying, you know, it's, it's, I was just saying social media and YouTube, there's a lot of resources on both of those platforms. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, if you're following me, I'm always tagging people in posts or, you know, people that I'm interacting with on my page. A lot of them are also real estate investors. So you can go there. You can go, like I said, go to my YouTube. Um, there's free information there as well. But it just allows you to, the opportunity to, you know, dig as deep as you want to before you decide if you want to monetarily invest more and in learning more about, you know, the investing side of real estate. Yes, and just a quick question on the Houston real estate uh, market. So what is your take on the real estate market here in Houston? Um, do you think this has this is this chance for it to, you know, you know, grow um, bigger than it is right now? Houston is the fastest growing city. You know, Houston used to be the fourth largest city, but we're actually, we've actually surpassed Chicago now. Um, and when you look at cost of living for the, the, the four largest cities, Houston is still the cheapest out of New York, LA, uh, Chicago, and here. It's still the cheapest. Um, Houston has the, probably the best medical district probably in the world. 
Um, it's the best in the United States for sure. So you have people from around the country coming here just for that. Um, it's also the oil and gas capital uh, of the U.S., even, so the energy capital. So no matter how oil, everything fluctuates, there's always going to be, be a demand here for, for in the healthcare industry and the energy sector. So Houston is very strong. Um, when you look at the 2008 recession, as compared to all the other big cities, Houston was the least hit as far as real estate prices. Um, and there's like 100,000 people a month moving to Texas now. And a, a big majority of those are coming to Houston. So yeah, Houston is strong, uh, especially that, like I said, the Fifth Ward neighborhood is really strong. It's the last area inside the loop that, uh, that hasn't been touched as far as a lot of revitalization. So tons of, tons of opportunity here. Um, I would say anything inside the loop is what's hot or close to the loop uh, on the south side, like the sunny side neighborhood, with, which now they're calling the uh, medical center south, um, all those areas, um, homestead, uh, acres homes areas, all those areas are really growing right now, Independence Heights. So anything that kind of touches the loop is still a great place to invest in. There's a lot of upside. All right, thank you so much for that answer. Um, we're kind of coming down to the um, last couple of minutes um, uh, for this call. So um, if you have, you know, some final questions for Chris, please, you know, this is the time to ask the question. Hey, Chris, this is Gabe. Um, I just have one question since we're wrapping this up. Um, so for someone who's never done this before, if you had to say your biggest obstacle, um, what would be your best advice to someone? Man, uh, I do sound like a broken record, but trying to figure it out on your own that's that's the biggest obstacle because i don't know what your skill set is you may be really good at financial planning um you may have a good eye for numbers um you may have you may be great networking have the right team uh, around you or you or you can find it but there's still always going to be something that you're missing and you're not going to know until you bump your head against the wall or you figure it out unless you got somebody guiding you showing you how to do it you know so uh, i'm a big advocate for mentorship um and not trying to figure it out on your own um, like I said, there's, for, for me starting off, I had a mentor and I tried to do some things on my own and I messed up, you know, so I made me realize I need to go back and listen to what, you know, I was being told and not try to, not try to jump out there on my own too soon. So I think that that's the most important thing I can tell you. Thank you very much, man. We're very proud of what you're doing. Uh, no problem, man. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, this, if there's any other questions, I'm going to just hand it over to Funsha to kind of um, close it out. Again, thank you so much, Chris, uh, for taking the time to be here today. Yep, no problem. Thank you. Oh, no, I have a question. I was multitasking. Okay. So you have all this cash flow coming in. Now, with everything, everything that's going on in America, as far as, you know, the fiat is going down, the money value is going down in America. And as you know, they're asking to buy coins back, change, you know, quarters, nickels, and dimes. Mm -hmm. So are you going to continue to put your money in these institutes over here? Well, uh, so there's always going to be some type of currency exchange in the U.S., whether it's going to be the dollar or it's going to change to something else. So there always, there always will be a, an exchange of some type here. So until that changes, yes, I will continue to participate in that process. Um, I mean, if you look at other countries where their, their value of their currency is a lot, lot less than the, than the dollar, they still function, right? So uh, it's it's not so much that everything is going to implode. It's just that it's going to change state. I mean, maybe it does convert over to crypto at some point in time, but the, you know, you don't you don't stop in the process because of projection of what may possibly happen in the future. Yeah, um, I agree. Oh, I'm sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, no, I agree with you. But you think about it, because I've been learning, you know, financial literacy, you know, only for a few months now. And the American dollar is not backed by anything. Mm -hmm. you know very few, very, very few countries in the world are. You know, it used to be that way. But very, I mean, that's, that's one of the, the one of the main reasons they believe that they got rid, rid of Gaddafi because they felt like he, he was yeah, trying to Obama. Obama got rid of Gaddafi because Gaddafi wanted to have the one currency. Yes. So, opinion. yeah, and, and he wanted to be everything to be backed by gold again. So, I mean, yeah, th there's a lot of things that are a lot deeper than what we can actually solve as civilians or, you know, in, in, in society. 
Um, so some, unfortunately, some part of those games you just have to play. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I mean that's true, but you know, I mean, I grew up in the West, and how can I say it? I got a little tongue tied. Um, we don't own no land here per se. It's just you own the brick and the mortar on the land. So it's like, okay, it's just like money just, you collecting a lot of money. But well, then when you own your own land, say you own a piece of land, we're just going to say Ghana. You own that piece of land. So if you feel like you want to dig on your land and find that precious, precious, you know, <laughs> stones, minerals, you know what I'm saying? Nobody can, you know, take that away from you. Yeah, that's true to a certain extent. I mean, in, in the U.S., even if you own the property outright, you still have to pay property taxes, and they'll take it from you if you don't pay the property taxes. Yeah, um, but, yeah. but, you know, I mean, but that happens in a lot of places in the world um, as well. I mean, when, when somebody, I saw a comment earlier that said real estate is still real, and that's very true. Real estate, was, real estate was the very first uh, profit generator. That's why, that's what a kingdom was. The ruler owned all the land, the territory or whatever, the kingdom. And he collected tariffs from everybody the same way. So property taxes have, all, have always been in existence. In existence. There's, cause when you don't have that, what you have on the other side of that is you have a lot of land, but you, have, um, you don't have any utilities running to the land. You don't have any infrastructure because that, that, that central organization that runs that area, if they don't have the money coming from somewhere, which is usually taxes to pay for running sewer lines, to pay for water lines, to pay for electricity, then, then you have a land, but you have no infrastructure on the land. So it's a give or take, right? You have to do a little bit of both. Well, I mean, it can be a give and take. Um, that's why I asked you, would you venture out to the continent while you still yeah. got your, your cash flow there? Because, you know, infrastructure is heavily needed on the continent. Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. It, I believe it, it, what it's going to take is a combination of both. Like, continue to have okay. the cash flow here. I'm going to get at you. I'm going to get your email. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, no problem. Thank, thank you so much, um, Chris, for your time. Um, just want to uh, say we appreciate you. I'm just going to hand it over to Flynn Shaw to kind of uh, kind of close, um, close this meeting out. Thank you so much. Hey, Chris. Uh, thanks once again. Lots of germs and so inspired by your story. So our last segment is what we call the common sense finance tip. So can you just share what you might consider a common sense finance tip? Okay, sure. So my fi common sense finance tip is everyone on this call has to live somewhere. So um, if you're going to rent, make sure you rent someone that, that, that is below your means. Um, I, and I, I also want you to know, I do not con I do not look down on people that choose to rent because your, your, your living cost every month is fixed. If something goes wrong with that property, um, you have somebody to call that's going to fix it for you. You don't have to worry about paying property taxes. You don't have to worry about insurance. You don't have to worry about any of that. Um, so if your goal is to build your wealth in other areas, um, maybe you want to focus on your career, maybe you want to invest in stocks, renting can be good for you. If you're going to buy a home, do not think that just buying a home anywhere is going to be a good financial decision. Because you can buy, if, if, if that was the truth, we would, there would be no need for the word foreclosure, okay? So if you're going to uh, buy a home, make sure you have a realtor that has studied the area that you're in. Make sure that the values are going up, okay? Make sure that there's high demand in that area where even if you have to move and you cannot sell your house, that the rents in that area are higher than what your mortgage payment is going to be. Um, or you also want to make sure that if you do have to sell it, there is demand. People are act actively buying houses in that neighborhood, and it doesn't look like that trend is going away anytime soon. Those three things will help you if you ever get in a situation where, say, you're having to lose a job or your financial situation changes and you have to move out of that house, you have a good exit strategy to get out of that house. Um, so that's my financial tip. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. And can you just one more time share your social media handle so people can follow you? Oh, yeah, I'll put it in the, in the, uh, in the chat. It's underscore I-N-B-S-T-R. Awesome. So once again, thank you, everybody, for joining us. This is uh, African Business Club. Our goal is to normalize financial literacy, networking, and collaboration as well. So if, if you haven't done so already, drop an email as well. We're going to send you a video recording of this uh, session. 
this week. So drop an email in the chat section and we'll forward that to you. And also follow us on IG, Instagram, Facebook, on YouTube as well. And make sure you share this with your family and friends as well. So once again, like we always say every single segment, we are kings and queens. So let's treat each other with love, respect, and empower each other every single time. Thank you, everybody, and have a blessed week. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris. All right. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. 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 Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.